Tonight I want to talk about the, uh, the church, the local church. What defines a local congregation? First of all, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, there it says Jesus makes the promise when Peter had said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said in verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. In that passage, the word church applies to all Christians everywhere. The universal body of Christ composed of all believers. But there's a number of times when the church applies to, the word church applies to, a local group of people. One of the things that defines a local congregation is location. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, it was a congregation that, was compo that met in Corinth. People lived there. That's where it was located. That's where the assembly was. Now, there, was, there were at Antioch in the church that was there. There was a congregation in Antioch. Congregation met in Antioch. Worship in Antioch. Have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. There was a congregation in the city of Laodicea. So one of the things that defines a local congregation would be a local congregation has a location, a place where it meets worship, a definite geographical area. There's a location. How is the church organized? What sort of organization, this church that Jesus established, what sort of organizational structure does it have? First of all, there is a universal organization, and that's in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 22, he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. Right there, that passage says the universal organization of the church is Jesus. Jesus is the head. He is the head of, over all things to the church. There is no other organizational structure besides that. That's important because sometimes when you run into people, and for the young people, when you run into people, you run into people that are members of churches that have a national headquarters or they have a state headquarters. You, you know people that, ha that churches have universal officers, that is, that they have human officers that run the whole show. It may be a group of men that run the whole show. It may be one man that runs the whole show. But in Ephesians chapter 1, it's very clear that the organization of the universal church is that Christ is the head. But we're talking about the local church. What sort of organizational structure does a local congregation have? Well, we have passages like this in Acts chapter 14 and in verse 23. There it says, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, that is, in every congregation. So there's a passage early on in the book of Acts that each congregation was to have its own elders. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17, you have something similar to that. From Miletus he sat to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. That is the elders of the church at Ephesus. Ephesus had its own elders. In verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. I think the implication there is that the flock that the Holy Spirit had made them overseers of is the flock at Ephesus. Not a flock somewhere else. And not the flock universally. They're not elders over the entire church on earth. The flock they've been in charge of, the, the flock that they've been appointed to, is the flock in Ephesus. That congregation that meets in Ephesus, that's the flock that they're specifically to oversee. And in Philippians chapter 1, so Acts 14, those congregations had their own elders, elders in every church. Ephesus had its own elders. And then in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, we find that the church at Philippi, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, 
to all the saints in Philippi, or in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, including, including what's also at Philippi, elders and deacons. Philippi has its own deacons, and Philippi has its own elders. And those elders or deacons are at Philippi. They don't live halfway around the world somewhere. And I think that's important. The elders, the elders overseeing the church in Philippi, don't live 500 miles away. They live there in Philippi. Now, how local is local? Can a congregation be composed of more than one congregation? Can one large church be composed of a whole bunch of smaller house churches? Would that still be the biblical pattern? Can a large church have campuses in other parts of town, other, part, other cities, or other countries? Can a mother church have satellite churches underneath her? Is that a local congregation? That's what I'm about my question. How local is local? Because you live in a religious world where there are churches that have campuses across town. And I think they would claim to be that they're, they're, they're one congregation. We just happen to have a campus or annex over there. They might even have different satellites in an area, in a town, uh, in another town, across the border into another state. They might have satellites of their church overseas, all under one eldership. Is that <coughs> scriptural? Some passages that people use to try to prove that, one would be Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Now, does this mean that one group of elders can oversee all the congregations in one city? That's the way some people take it. As long as each city had its own elders, no matter how many congregations were there, but one eldership can oversee an entire city of churches. If we had no other passages, that could be a possibility if we had no other passages. But you always have to check out the other passages. Number one, we have absolutely no example or examples of elders overseeing a congregation which is composed of smaller congregations. We have no example of elders in one congregation overseeing another congregation somewhere else. What we do have examples of, or direct statements for, are elders overseeing the flock that is among them. For, for example, there is a, we've already looked at the example, Acts chapter 14, where they appointed elders, not in every city, they appointed elders in every church. We have Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, the elders and deacons at Philippi, overseeing the Philippian congregation. But we also have a passage over in the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, this would be a direct statement or a direct command. The elders are addressed in verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder in sufferings, or witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter's the writer. Peter speaks of himself as a fellow elder. Elders have to be husbands of one wife, Titus 1. Having children that believe, Titus 1. Therefore, Peter was a married man and had believing children. That's important. And then in verse 2, Peter says, Shepherd the flock of God among you. That is a direct statement. That is a very specific direct statement. That statement or that command limits the oversight of elders to the flock that they're a member of, the flock among them. A group of people over here in another town, they're not among me. 
uh, how much more a group in another state or a group in another country. They are certainly not among me. I don't know how any elder could justify overseeing a congregation overseas. Not, they're not even close to being among you. Or in another state, or in another town. This is a very practical thing because when the new congregation was formed at sunset, probably a number of people in the religious world would have said, well, just oversee that group. You start a group out there, but you continue to oversee it here. I mean, you, you put the effort into it. You converted some of those people or developed some of those people and so you just continue to oversee that group. That's the way a number of people would have done it in the religious world. But it's not the biblical pattern. And, and that's, that's why, like, as the men discuss things like that when that group was formed, once that group was formed, that was its own group. And that group had to make its own decisions. And there were now two separate groups. I had a comment here in other terms. Elders have no business shepherding a group of people that they never see. Or seeing frequently, what I meant by that was, like there's a group out there that oversee, and we will see you every six months. You know, we, we, have, we have this group here, and then we have seven satellites seven satellites throughout Oregon or whatever, and every six months or whatever, one of us will come through and just see how things are going. Now, that's the way a number of religious groups do it. Is someone comes through from kind of the head office and checks up on how things are going. But First Peter chapter 5 would say, no, 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 you can't do that. The authority of elders is limited to the flock of God among them. Now, there would be another application here I think that elders might make is that, number one, I have no authority overseeing a group of people that I see infrequently. So, to the people that are here, attend frequently because I really can't shepherd you very well if you're never here, and you guys don't have a problem with that because you're here Sunday night. But if you know somebody with a problem with attendance, you might remind them, you know what? Among other things, I mean, not attending is a bad idea. You're not growing spiritual, etc. But how in the world are Bart and Fred going to watch out for your soul if they hardly see you? How is an elder going to shepherd you when they don't see you? That's another good reason to, today's good reason to attend and attend frequently. Uh, Acts chapter 14, 23. I would put the two verses together. Titus 1, 5 says elders in every city. But Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, elders in every church. If just one congregation was in a city, you would still have elders in every city. If, he, if there was just one congregation there, then that would still satisfy Titus 1, 5. That's elders in every city. If more than one congregation existed per city, then each congregation was to have its own elders, Acts 14, 23, and guess what? That would still be elders in every city. If there are two congregations in a certain city, and both congregations have elders, that's elders in every city. That's not elders over an entire city. That's not elders shepherding all the churches in that city. No, that would be a violation of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. That would be a good example of where you would interpret Titus 1.5 by some other passages, like Acts 14.23, each congregation has its own elders, an example, and 1 Peter 5.2, a direct command is elders can over, only oversee the flock of God among them. Another observation I have here is to, to me I found that typically a church that opts to have satellite groups does not stop at having a group in the same city. They typically tend to move farther and farther out and now they have a congregation in another city. In the, in the Boston movement, 
the uh, discipling movement, that's what happened there. You would have a big congregation composed of all these little house churches in a city. And they would justify that on the basis of like Titus 1.5. The trouble is that people started looking at that. Number one, that's not what Titus 1.5 teaches. But number two, people started looking at some of the addresses on those house churches, and they were not all in the same city. Some of them were quite a ways away. And they even start like, well, if we can have a satellite over there, then we can have a satellite over in that state across the border, and we can have a satellite overseas as well. Acts 2.46. Here's another passage that I've heard people kind of use to kind of defend this idea of like a big mother church, and then in the mother church you have all these groups, all these local churches, and maybe every now and then all those local churches come together for one big assembly. All right? Like a big mothership with all separate ships. Now and then all the ships come in and dock. Okay? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, day by day continueth one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. A lot of, there are some people that see that passage and here's what they see. They see the church in Jerusalem composed of a whole bunch of house churches. And kind of the argument is that the church in Jerusalem got so big so fast that they had no place where they could meet on the first day of the week. And so what they had to do is divide up into a whole bunch of smaller meetings or a whole bunch of house churches. And so you got a big congregation, but that big congregation rarely, if ever, meets together. It meets in different homes throughout the community. And people read Acts 2.46 and they say, I think that's what's going on there. And that's not at all what that passage is saying at all. Was the church in Jerusalem composed of smaller congregation or house churches? Here's how I would divide up the passage. Day by day continue with one mind in the temple. That is, this congregation was not too big to assemble. They did assemble all together. They assembled in the temple area. That's where they assembled to worship. That's how they worship. That's what they did for Bible study and things like that. Acts chapter 5 would tell you the same thing. Verse, 13, uh, verse 12. At the hand of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. They met. They all met together. There was a place big enough where they could all meet for worship. The second, the second part of the passage, I think the right way to view the passage is that the second part of the passage is not talking about a worship service. The second part of the passage is talking about how they socialized and how they met their needs. And breaking bread from house to house. Now, first part of the passage already tells you tells you they met in the temple area. That's where they met. That's where they would meet for like Bible study and worship and things like that. The second part of that passage is not talking about worship or a worship service. Breaking bread from house to house, they were, what were they doing from house to house? Worship services? No. What were they doing from house to house? It says they were taking their meals. And so I think the first part of the passage is talk about here's how this group worshipped. The second part of the passage is here's how they socialized. Or here's kind of how they met one another's needs. They opened up their homes to one another and that's where they took their meals together. That's how they socialized. When I look at the scriptures, I find, I find that a congregation was composed of individuals, not churches, or smaller churches, or many churches. Like in 1 Corinthians 12, 20, many members but one body. The church at Corinth was composed of many members, not many bodies, or not, not like five or six bodies, but many members made up the church in Corinth. I can't think of any passage that even hints that a local congregation is composed of anything other than people. 
and not other or smaller local congregations. Here would be some passages I would use to kind of maintain that point. When it came to assembling to partake of communion, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, Paul does not say, when the house churches come together to compose a bigger church or a larger church. But he says, when you come together as a church, not when all these satellites come together, not when all these smaller groups come together, but when you, well, who is the you? Well, you the Corinthians. That is when you, you Corinthians, you individuals, when you gather together as a church, here's what you need to be doing. He didn't say when the churches in Corinth come together, but when you come together. Phoebe was a servant of the church at Centria, Romans chapter 16 and verse 1. And Centria was only seven miles down the road from Corinth. And yet, who is a servant of the church which is at Centria, the Corinthian church had not gobbled up that congregation. Seven miles apart, and they were two separate congregations. She was a servant of the church there, not of the church in Corinth. That's where, that's where she, that's where her membership was. That's where she was a member. That's where she served. In that congregation. That, that church was a separate, distinct congregation from the congregation at Corinth. There was a congregation in Colossae. There was a congregation in Laodicea. But those towns are only about 10 to 12 miles away, not that far apart, yet they are distinct congregations. Colossians 4.16, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you for your part read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. That church of Laodiceans was its own congregation. It wasn't the Colossian church, it was the church of Laodiceans. It was a separate congregation. On Paul's first journey, we know it's a passage in Acts 14, 23. Many of the towns there in Paul's first journey, like a lot of towns today that are established, you know, we're 10 miles away, 15 miles away, because that's about as far as you can go. The south is kind of interesting. You go, you go down south, and you will find a church of Christ, a buggy's ride away from the last church of Christ that you just saw. That's how far they're away, like a buggy's ride, like... How far you would go in a wagon, you know, on an afternoon or whatever. It kind of a buggy's right away. That was its own group over there. And that's the same thing you would find in the ancient world. You would find another town, you know, about a day's journey away. The seven churches of Asia were all in the same geographical region, yet they were all separate. And I think this is important. When Paul, when Jesus communicates to the churches of Asia in the book of Revelation, verse 4, chapter 1, John 2. Now, that could, have, that could have been written in all sorts of ways. It could have been John 2, the one church. In Asia, just the one big church in Asia. All right? It could have been John to the, the Asian diocese, or however you call it, but the, the, the group of churches there in Asia that all are linked together. Could have been that. But it's not written that way. John to the seven churches, seven congregations that are in Asia. I think, you know, when you look at the Revelation letter and you look at that and I think that's, that's pretty important, but let me pause just a little bit, and I'm not sure if it's a upcoming, so let me hold this thought. Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17, here's another passage that to me, I would cite this as evidence that a local church is composed of individuals, and a local church is not composed of smaller 
churches. Because in Matthew 18, in, in how we're told to handle a brother or sister who is in sin, if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a tax gatherer. If a local church is composed of smaller house churches, then to me in Matthew 18, we're missing a step. I mean, Matthew 18 should read, go to them, take your witnesses, then go at the house church level, then bring it to the church that the house church is plugged into, but there's no step like that. Which means there's no organization like that. It's individual, then bring a couple more people, then you just bring it before the assembly. You bring it before the local group. And I don't know, I think that's an interesting passage to take a look at. To me, there's some practical problems. We looked at the scriptural problems. To me, there's some practical problems if a church is composed of smaller churches. In the book of Revelation, Ephesus, Jesus said, among all the things you've done right, You've persevered, you've tested false apostles. Among all the things that you've done right, I've got a problem with you. You've left your first love. If the Ephesian church was composed of a whole bunch of smaller house churches, had every house church left its first love? That to me wouldn't make any sense. All of them, all of them have left their first love? Was, if Laodicea was composed of house churches, was, was every house church in Laodicea lukewarm? I mean, what's the chances of that? Every little group there lukewarm? And, I don't know, to me that's just true of all the things there was, to me it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that if we've got this big group composed of all these groups, what the chances that all of them left their first love, all of them are living on the past, Sardis, all of them are lukewarm, or reverse it. Was every house church in Smyrna faithful? Every house church in Philadelphia faithful? Every house church in Thyatira, whatever, were they tolerating the Nicolaitans? All of them? It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me when I read that passage. All right. Who oversees the house church? We know elders oversee a local congregation, but who oversees that smaller unit? Here's what I have found. When, when people take a local church and alter it, okay, and say, in, instead of this local church being composed of individuals, we're going to expand this local church and we're going to put in, diff and we're going to put groups in there. Guess what? Guess what's going to go in with that? Bureaucracy. You're going to find a layer of authority, and this is what happened in the Boston movement, the discipleship movement. All of a sudden, you, you heard this term of house church leader. Not elder, not deacon, not evangelist, not teacher, house church leader. All of a sudden you have a level of bureaucracy that does not exist in the Bible. And let me qualify that. I don't think there's any bureaucracy in the local congregation, okay? I think a local congregation is extremely streamlined. So let's, let's just say there is no bureaucracy. God gave no bureaucracy to a local congregation. He gave Jesus' head, elders and shepherds, Deacons as assistants, that's streamlined. There's no bureaucracy in any of that. That's, that is such a wonderful model of leadership. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Warren Buffett has gone around to a number of people like Bill Gates and his wife, and he's tried to convince a number of very wealthy people to leave part of their fortune to charity. 
leave like 10% of it. Leave it to charity. And a number of people have signed up for that, the Gates have signed up, et cetera, that they're going to leave a, a portion of their income just to charity when they die. It's interesting, though, how they've set this up. No specific charity has been designated for them. Okay? Number two, they're not to give their money to a group out here then that takes the money and funnels it to charities. Uh-uh. It's interesting what they're doing. They're kind of following the biblical pattern. That is, no, you don't give your money to a human organization out here that then decides a charity. You as an individual, Mr. Gates and your wife, you determine which charity you're going to give it to, and you give it directly to them. And, and it was kind of interesting. Cindy was listening to that and says, you know what? That's really the biblical model, isn't it? is that you don't go through some sort of clearinghouse. You go directly to the people in need. That's what you do. And I, th I just thought that was interesting. Uh, a number of people have kind of come more around to kind of doing things the Bible way of, let's cut out the middleman, and I'm going to give my money directly to the people that are in need, and then bypass everything, and I will choose it. And I kind of like that. As Christians, that's what we do as individuals. Churches are the same way. God set up a local church where if you're going to support a preacher, you send the money directly to him. If there are some Christians in need, you send it directly to the Christians that are in need. And there's no middleman in any of that. What a streamlined, wise way of doing things. Also, there's no qualifications for any sort of office known as a house church leader. What are the qualifications for that? And where are they given? You know, it's been my experience that something always fills the void. In groups that I've seen that have opted for the group composed of groups, rather than individuals at each local, uh, rather each local group ends up with its own leadership and its own authority structure that you can't find in Scripture. And then finally, as we close the lesson, you will find this expression in a number of passages. The church that is in their house. The discipleship movement really would camp on these passages and say, see, the congregation in Rome was composed of all these smaller house churches. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. And greet also the church that is in their house. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. We have it there as well. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All right. Again, this is one of those places where automatically we know what that does not mean. It doesn't mean that the church in Corinth or Ephesus or whatever was composed of a whole bunch of smaller house churches. We know that. It could be that simply he's saying, greet Priscilla and Aquila and the Christians in their family. The Christians are in the household. In fact, that's what Thayer says, the church in one's house. The company of Christians belonging to a person's family. Okay? Another alternative is simply this. The congregation that meets in their home. Not that that congregation is under another congregation, but there's a number of congregations, and you've you probably att attended some in your lifetime. The congregation meets in a person's home. Nobody oversees that congregation. That congregation is not part of a bigger congregation. That congregation is its own autonomous congregation. It may have its own elders. But that congregation just happens for the moment to meet in somebody's home on Wednesday night. The congregation, the Sunset Congregation, meets in the Van Fleet's home. That would be greet Aaron and Julie and the church in their house. That would fit the bill for them. This is a little bit different lesson than this morning's lesson. But I have found, I have found, and, and just, it wasn't that long ago that I had to explain this concept to someone who was a Christian. And I thought, I don't want to take anything for granted. And I want to make sure that the next congregation understands why 
that when the Sunset Group was established, that the church in Beaverton did not maintain control of that group. Why does that group have to be its own group? This is the reason why. All of us will live long enough either to see a situation like that arise again, or for those that are younger, you may move and go somewhere and see a similar congregation happen. And I think you just, and you may be in a men's business meeting, and you need to know like, well, what the scriptures teach on that, because maybe somebody doesn't know these passages. May. Now, on another practical level, the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is to hear the gospel, believe that Jesus is the Christ, turn from your sins, repent, confess your faith in Christ, be baptized and immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's be standing and singing the imitation song.